Many folklore, fairy tales, and legends include stories of illnesses, enchantment, and death caused by poisons. But some of them may in reality be based on science. The Mad Hatter in Alice in Wonderland who became mad. It was due to mercury poisoning that was then used to felt hats. In the final act of Romeo and Juliet, the heroine takes a potion that puts her in a death-like state. Many believe that she used the deadly nightshade or Atropa belladonna, an atropine derivative. Zombie powder that animates the living dead is an animal extract derived tetrodoxin. Did Snow White die and awaken with true love's kiss the same way? For the latter portion of this afternoon's lecture, we will tackle toxicology, which is a very exciting branch of medicine as well as pediatrics. The most common reported poisonings in the local scene according to the National Poison Control Unit of the Philippine General Hospital as are as follows in the year 2020. Notice how isopropyl alcohol and sodium hypochlorite top the list in the pediatric age group. These are commonly used disinfectants since the pandemic started. Our discussion on common pediatric poisons will also be guided by this list later. The PGH-based Poison Control Unit is the first one in the country and a national referral center. Specialty referrals can be made over the phone both by patients and MDs. There are toxicology fellows on duty to answer the calls 24-7. Fortunately, we have a local counterpart based in the Baguio General Hospital that has recently opened a few years ago. Most poisonings actually occur in the home and involve two peaks in pediatrics, one during the ages less than five years and the other during adolescence. Most are accidental in the first peak in children, whereas more are intentional in teens. Ingestion or the oral route is the most common in pediatrics, but ocular, inhalational, dermal, and rectal poisoning can also occur. Faced with a patient scenario at the ER, what are you going to do? You are the lone pedia clerk assigned to the ER. A distraught mother rushes in and demands medical attention ASAP. She reports that five hours ago, her daughter has ingested the following. Silica gel, fishbowl additives, hydrogen peroxide, matches, play-doh, and plant food. First, calm the mother down. Examine the patient. Say, for instance, she was stable and active and playful at the ER and her PE was normal. Then, explain that these, including silica gel, are common but non-toxic ingestions, most especially if they are ingested in small volumes. But she may not be as lucky in the future if no preventive and anticipatory guidance is initiated. Take the time to interview the mother for a thorough family, social, and environmental history. The home situation needs an evaluation. Ask her the following questions. How was the level of supervision? Was the guardian busy or distracted? Do they usually use empty beverage, litro, or gallon containers for kerosene refills or other chemicals? Where do they store their harmful chemicals? How is the child's developmental level? Is there pica? Teach her poisoning prevention and make sure she understands. And if poisoning does happen, know where to go or who to call. The situation is different though if the poisoning list includes the following. Carbon monoxide inhalation, ingestion of batteries, especially the disc type, Ingestion of opioid analgesics and cardiovascular drugs, which may be medications of elders in the home. Taking of illicit drugs and inhalation and aspiration of aliphatic hydrocarbons. And some common medications used by our household members can be toxic in small amounts, as small as 5 ml or 1 to 2 pills. Please look up this table in your textbook. As in most medical situations, prevention is always better than cure. Use child-resistant packaging, educate the household on anticipatory guidance for the prevention of poisoning, and learn the signs of toxic exposure. 
medical specialty center should be available and accessible for referrals. Please remember these very important local numbers and contact details. In the cases of life-threatening, urgent poisoning in the ER setup though, it is a race against time. As first-liners, use your stock knowledge, high index of suspicion, and skill for a quick but thorough history and PE, simultaneous with the timely administration of treatment, which is often supportive. In the ABCDs, the D or drugs are considered but antidotes are available only for a few poisons and not all local institutions or pharmacies carry them. In the PE of a tox patient, use all of your five senses quickly and simultaneously. Upon arrival, notice how the patient behaves. Focus on how he smells. Take his temperature, gauge the appearance and feel of the skin and presence of perspiration, even if it entails feeling for the armpits. What is the appearance of the pupils? How is the patient's breathing pattern? Does he have hypo or hyperactive bowel sounds? And of course, complete your neuro exam. Specific PE findings may be pathognomonic of the type of poisoning involved. Say for instance, a patient smells like bitter almonds. This may indicate cyanide poisoning. A seemingly cyanotic baby but with normal O2 sats and does not respond to oxygen inhalation may actually be suffering from methemoglobinemia caused by the following agents. Or, in the presence of meiosis or persistent pupillary constriction, consider the agents with the acronym COPS. What about the seemingly possessed or delirious patient who comes into the ER? Consider the following. In other times, however, it is a combination of signs that lead to a diagnosis, and these are known as toxidromes. True story. Five years ago, an 18-year-old female college student with no previous medical condition suddenly loses consciousness at a famous rave concert in Pasay. Upon arrival of the medics who had difficulty getting to her due to the crowds, the patient was unarousable. Pupils dilated. She was tachycardic, blushed, and diaphoretic. She was rushed to the nearest hospital but was declared dead on arrival. Some theorized it might have been due to the summer heat or absence of water stations nearby, but there was an element of suspicion for drug-related death. Because five more patients completely unrelated to the first victim surfaced with the exact same symptoms, including a 22-year-old alumni from SLU. For the four who were autopsied, the cause of death was cardiomegaly, cardiac failure, and multiple organ damage. The symptoms seemed to point out to a sympathomimetic syndrome, which was further confirmed with a positive test for ecstasy and shabu. In another patient, say for instance, he presented instead with very dry skin or no sweat and dilated pupils and tachycardia and hypertension, then the anticholinergic syndrome should be considered. Common drugs when taken in excess and some of the agents that cause these are the antihistamines, tricyclic antidepressants, atropine, and even poisoning with a certain variety of mushrooms. The common description of patients with the anticholinergic syndrome is as follows. It's actually a little bit uh, for familiarization rather than as a shortcut or a mnemonic. Mad as a hatter, full as a flask, blind as a bat, dry as a bone, hot as a hair, and red as a beet. Another famous toxidrome occurs in many attempted suicides with the ingestion of organophosphate insecticides, which incidentally is common in many farming communities in the Philippines including the Cordilleras. The typical picture is a wet patient. You can remember the symptoms with the acronym dumbbells or sludge. Remember, all wet as in all secretions and excretions are triggered. There are several more toxidromes in our textbook for your reading pleasure. Please give them a browse. 
Diagnostics to detect specific poisonings are limited and usually unavailable. And drug level determinations usually are available only in research laboratories and do take a lot of time. Our urine drug screen in the Philippines is also limited to shabu and marijuana only. Typically, a chem panel is ordered at the ER, which includes serum electrolytes, ABGs, renal function tests, and glucose. From here, you can already compute the anion gap and serum osmolality. Several of the so-called mud pile scat are actually toxic chemicals and poisons. If you remember from physiology, it's actually an acronym to signify the agents that cause metabolic acidosis. These will provide an important clue in determining an unknown poison. You may use x-ray if the toxic ingestion is a radio-opaque substance. Oh, and by the way, for many teen female patients who attempt suicide, it is necessary to test for pregnancy. The D in the ABCD is twofold, decontamination and drugs. Bathing the patient with mild soap, in the Philippines, we commonly use Perla, Perla bar. In cutaneous toxin exposure, we wash them with water and this soap. And when we have ocular intoxication or poisoning, flush the eyes with running NSS or saline for 15 minutes. These are common examples of effective decontamination methods. However, GI decontamination by means of emesis that is induced, gastric lavage, or catharsis are losing popularity in tox treatment because of its apparent lack of benefit. It's actually quite harmful in most times. Syrup of ipecac, which used to be available in many households for inducing vomiting in children, has already been phased out. Lavage is difficult and painful to do. A large bore NGT is needed which can make the patient vomit and possibly aspirate, especially if unconscious. Activated charcoal, at best, absorbs only 30% of the toxin and binds only to a few specific substances. Both lavage and activated charcoal are only maximally useful within 1 hour to 2 hours of ingestion. Whole bowel irrigation is probably the only modality that is of use in this list. Other methods to hasten elimination of poison are as follows. The antidotes are perfect as recall questions for the exams, of which we have a few in this slide. For acetaminophen, the antidote is N-acetylcysteine. For organophosphate and carbamate pesticides, it's atropine and or pralidoxim. For iron, deferoxamine. For lead, arsenic, mercury, and other heavy metals, the group of BAL or British anti lewisite EDTA, and DMSA are used. Please review the additional table with the details provided here. We will discuss a few of the common pediatric poisons in the Philippines in more detail in the following section. Top 1. Accidental ingestion of sanitizers and rubbing alcohol have been a recent problem as they have been accessible and highly encouraged with the rising cases of COVID-19. And more children have had access to it as well. As much as the bitter nature should deter curious children from drinking or eating them, marketing them as fruit or candy scented and cutely packaged ones have added to the attraction of these poisons to kids. The ingestion is usually very small and not enough to inflict any damage, but in large volumes, the clinical effects are similar to ethanol, with intoxication, inebriation, and later gastritis. Myocardial infarction and respiratory depression are also possible. The difference between isopropyl and ethanol poisoning is that it does not cause metabolic acidosis. The management is mainly supportive. Ingestion of sodium hypochlorite with the brand names Clorox or Zonrox is a common observed method of suicide. Sodium hypochlorite is classified under the class of caustics. Alkaline caustics like Clorox 
including also drain cleaners, are relatively tasteless, so more is ingested. The acidic caustics like hydrochloric acid, aka muriatic acid, are very bitter and less ingestion is anticipated unless it is intentional. Additionally, for acids, coagulation, necrosis, and eschar formation renders it less dangerous than alkali. However, both can lead to GI irritation, burns, perforation, and later strictures necessitating dilatation, resection, or placement of stents. It is also a risk for esophageal cancers. Dilution with water or milk as a first aid household remedy can be effective, but emesis, lavage, and activated charcoal are not. Paracetamol, called acetaminophen in other countries, is available in many forms and preparations and is used left and right in pediatrics with the common perception that it is one of the safest medications to give. It is, however, the most common cause of acute liver failure and consequently liver transplant in the U.S. The onset of symptoms in paracetamol poisoning is gradual, but at stage 2, the liver damage is profound. By stage 3 or day 3 to 5 post-ingestion, death can ensue if there is no proper treatment. The breakdown product of paracetamol is a tongue twister. N-acetyl-P-benzoquinonimine or NAPQI, which binds to our natural liver stores of glutathione. When gluta is depleted, NAPQI now renders hepatocyte damage. What is the acute toxic dose of paracetamol? It's 150 to 200 milligrams per kilo. Note that we give this therapeutically to relieve fever and pain in 10 to 15 milligram per kilogram per dose only. Ideally, paracetamol levels should be obtained 4 hours post-ingestion as a guide for whether or not to treat with the antidote N-acetylcysteine. This so-called RUMAC Matthew nomogram, though, applies to acute ingestions only. If the patient's level fall under these areas, immediate oral or IV NAC or N-acetylcysteine is given. Kerosene along with toluene, benzene, pain thinners or removers are members of the aliphatic carbon group. When ingested, it is a local irritant, but the real danger comes when this is vomited and aspirated. Alveolar surfactant is inhibited, leading to pneumonitis and ARDS. The more volatile, the more dangerous it is. The toxic dose is as little as 1 ml of aspirated kerosene. Later, cardiac, nervous, and renal complications occur, including acute tubular necrosis, and renal tubular acidosis. So, a baseline x-ray should be taken 6 hours post-aspiration. Cardiac status and renal function are also monitored closely. Respiratory support without antibiotics and steroids is the dictum of treatment. Induced emesis, lavage, and activated charcoal are all contraindicated. Esmolol can be used for dysrhythmias. Another perception of benign overdosing is with multivitamins. Of concern are the fat-soluble ones that are not excreted in the urine, such as in the case of hypervitaminosis A, which can cause increased intracranial pressure and bone abnormalities, such as craniotabes. Another concern is overdosing with iron, which is toxic at 10 times the therapeutic dose. Local corrosive effects lead to GI complications, of which is perforation in the most extreme. Iron-induced hypotension can also occur, and iron is hepatotoxic and limits the synthetic and metabolic functions of the liver. It is also one of the members of the MUD piles acronym of metabolic acidosis. Staging of toxicity is as follows. Iron levels taken at 4 to 6 hours of ingestion when available as well as total iron binding capacity may be guides to anticipating urgency of treatment with the antidote. ABG, baseline liver function, 
anticoagulation profile and glucose levels are monitored. X-ray may be useful if capsule forms were ingested, but in dissolved or suspension type preparations, this may be difficult to see. Whole body irrigation is probably useful to facilitate quick passage of the ingested iron and prevent absorption in the GI tract. Specific antidote for iron ingestion in toxic doses is deferoxamine. When it chelates with iron and passes into the urine, a characteristic von Rose color is seen. Ibuprofen is also readily available in many households and is relatively safe but will be toxic at doses greater than 400 mg per kilo. The usual dose given in pediatrics is only 5 mg per kilogram per dose. Its side effect of GI irritation is amplified during intentional massive ingestions, as well as its antiplatelet properties. CNS and respiratory depression can also happen. Diagnostics should include ABGs, which will show metabolic acidosis. Treatment is basically supportive and there are no antidotes. Disc batteries are found in watches, thermoscans, and small flashlights. Ingestions are of a concern if these start to leak acid or discharge current. If it is found in the esophagus on an x-ray, chances are it will lodge there and extraction is indicated. However, if the batteries are found to have already passed to the stomach, chances are they will eventually be passed into the stools already. So watchful waiting is all that is necessary. Top 7 in our list are the pyrethroids. These are a group of pesticides of which the commonly accessible form is bygone liquid solution for spraying. These are pungent and kerosene-based as typically known, but there are water-based versions. Ingestion of it will lead to GI irritation and neurologic manifestations that include seizures, hyperexcitability, weakness, and paralysis. Take note that the treatment is supportive and there is no antidote, not even atropine. I will need to mention though the other types of insecticides which you might be already familiar with. The organophosphates that are irreversible and carbamates which are reversible acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Poisoning with these allow for the uninhibited firing of nicotinic and muscarinic nerve fibers. The end result is the cholinergic syndrome. The dumbbells and the sludge, as presented earlier, are common symptoms. Later complications include polyneuropathy and psychiatric symptoms. RBC cholinesterase level determination may be useful. Cutaneous decontamination is very practical, but in the GI route via activated charcoal, it is less effective. The treatment is IV atropinization using large doses until an almost anticholinergic toxidrome ensues. Pralidoxime or PAM can also be used but not available locally. I would also like to touch on the Philippine homemade alcohol, Lambanog. Just like moonshine in the US, if alcohol is improperly prepared, usually in the backyard industries in the provinces, Methanol content reaches dangerously high levels. Methanol then causes blindness and other visual disturbances which may be permanent. Later profound metabolic acidosis is quite advanced with associated renal failure. Due to delayed consult, which is very common as most attribute the symptoms to typical intoxication, irreversible damage and even death occurs. The toxic byproduct of methanol degradation is formic acid, which inhibits mitochondrial respiration. Liver enzymes degrade ethanol preferentially over methanol, which is why it was the old school antidote, intoxicate the intoxicated. Remember your old lectures back then, if a patient has methanol poisoning, ethanol is administered. But now with fomepizole, Success rates are greater and do not interfere or add up to the neurological side effects. Hemodialysis can also be done. 
folate and bicarb are essential adjuncts. So, how did Snow White die? Some toxicologists say that it was with locally available herb extracts. Others with the tetrodoxine, which is a thousand times more powerful than cyanide. In Asia, tetrodoxine can be extracted from the puffer fish or fugu or botete and other animals like the blue-ringed octopus and the rough-skinned newt. And others believe Snow White might have been given antifreeze or ethylene glycol-laced apples. Whichever manner it was, we can safely say that the wicked stepmother is learned not only in the dark arts, but a very smart toxicologist as well. So, beware of stepmothers, and oh yes, beware of apples too. Good afternoon, and thank you.